Welcome to All Things Keto. I am your host, Dr. Pete, and I'm flying solo today. My daughter is in uh, isolation um, and as well as I am, and, um, and so she's not going to be able to be part of the broadcast today. Um, the topic that I'm going to cover today is a question that has come up uh, not only from our clients, but also um, this is something that I've seen on Facebook uh, quite frequently. And, uh, and that question is, uh, why do you lose weight on the keto diet? Now, I'm going to address that, that question in two distinct ways. The first thing that we're going to do is talk about why people gain weight on the standard American diet. And that's really important that you understand that aspect of weight gain because in the ketogenic diet, we lose weight and we need to talk about why we have this basic uh, difference between the two lifestyles. We're going to do this a little differently today, so I'm going to take you out of the video onto a sketch pad where I feel more free to be able to uh, demonstrate some graphs and whatnot. And, um, and so we're going to go in and out of the image of, of me while I talk to you. The first thing we're going to do is deal with the standard American diet, which is a high carbohydrate diet, approximately 55 to 65 percent of the diet. Most people in the United States are eating uh, 300 grams or more of carbohydrates a day, and most people in the United States are eating five to seven times every single day. So well, let's go ahead and get started. After eating a meal, all of the carbohydrates, the different carbohydrates, are broken down uh, into glucose, which is then in your blood supply. And the glucose peak, uh, which I, I hand drew, is shown here. And you can see over the course of a typical meal, which could be, for example, somebody who just had breakfast, a big bowl of uh, uh, oatmeal, based on the package, probably several um, uh, servings of that oatmeal. They probably got bananas cut up in there and apples cut up in there. Uh, this is going to be a very high carbohydrate meal, probably 100 grams or more. And what's going to happen is over, over a time course of a few hours, they're going to have a blood glucose peak that's going to look something like this. In fact, it, the peak won't be as narrow and tall as this, it'll probably be more broad and extended. But the blood glucose level uh, will be peaked for a, a number of hours, probably uh, then decreasing around uh, three hours out here. Now, what inevitably causes the, the decrease in the blood glucose value is going to be uh, the insulin that is released into the blood supply to deal with the blood glucose. And the insulin uh, is going to pretty much mirror uh, the glucose peak. So I'll use red to indicate it. And so we could think of it this way. The, the insulin is going to be released in a proportional manner uh, to the amount of blood glucose that's in your blood supply. All right. And I... I hesitate to put both on the same graph because the units uh, for these two things are different. The blood glucose in the United States is measured as uh, milligrams of blood glucose per uh, deciliter, and the insulin is going to be measured as, as units. But the point is that as the blood glucose rises in your bloodstream, so does the insulin, and it rises in proportion to the blood glucose. The job of the insulin is, is to uh, basically force the glucose, which I'll abbreviate this way, uh, into cells. Liver, muscle, muscle cells, uh, brain, and, and so on. Now, in addition to this, we also have uh, another enzyme, which is part of this relationship, which is called leptin. And... Leptin is a hormone which 
in a lot of respects is very similar to insulin in that it is a master hormone <clears throat> and it is related to uh, appetite uh, suppression. So when this thing is released and, and this is going to be, this leptin is stimulated, its release is stimulated by insulin. So we have a cascade here. We have the glucose, which is entering the blood supply, which stimulates the insulin, which then stimulates leptin release. Now, if the leptin is released in moderate amounts, what's going to happen is, is that this is going to make you feel full. This is going to make you feel full. And the key thing is you stop eating. All right. And that's number one. You stop eating. And then the second aspect of this, let me just put an A here. And the second part of this is, is that uh, this is called the satiety hormone which I, I uh, for convenience of the viewer, I put the definition down here. This is basically the time between eating or the time between meals. So this, what it does is it creates a non-eating window. All right. Now, in addition to that, we also have the influence of another hormone that's called ghrelin. And the purpose of the ghrelin hormone, uh, most, most researchers are going to call this the hunger uh, hormone. So the, gren, uh, the, the ghrelin stimulates the need to eat. The need to eat. Now, Here's what's going on in the world of high, of a high carbohydrate diet. A number one, this glucose peak is excessive. All right, over the course of a day, as I mentioned earlier in this video, um, most um, people that are eating the standard American diet are are eating 300 grams of carbohydrates uh, a day or more. Actually, probably more. All right, it's a high insulin stimulating diet. And where uh, the reason why these people are gaining weight, and we're going to have to shift to another screen here for this, is because the insulin is excessive, number one. We have excessive insulin expression on SAD. On the standard American diet, and this causes an excessive. Let me let me put more uh, pluses up here. This causes an excessive expression of uh, leptin. All right, and excessive uh, leptin causes what's called leptin resistance. So if you, if you sit back for a minute and you think about what this means, you have a high degree of leptin circulating in the blood supply because of the excess of, first, the excessive uh, production of insulin, which stimulates an excessive uh, production of leptin, which uh, causes an, ex, uh, an excessive uh, situation where the leptin is uh, causing its its own dysregulation, all right, in terms of its ability um, to enter cells and so on. So what happens here with a high concentration of leptin is that um, this is the same situation you would have uh, with very low, low leptin expression. So the person who's eating um, does not have the sensation that they're full. So we have no fullness. 
All right, person keeps eating. So they're going to exceed the calories that they should in the meal. And then the second thing, and I'm going to have to go back to the other window for this, is that this has a tendency to decrease satiety. It decreases satiety. Now, again, what does this hormone uh, mean in English? It means that we shorten uh, the non eating window. Now here's the thing that you need to understand about this and we're going to go to another window. For individuals that are on the standard American diet, uh, most of those people, if they're not obese, they're overweight. All right? Overweight or obese. And even in my case, like before I went on the ketogenic diet, um, I was on or at my BMI. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't get below my BMI. And so I'm asserting here, and this is my own hypothesis, that even, even if this is what your situation is, is, and you're right, sitting right on top of your BMI, then you will have some of the following traits. And so for the the overweight or the obese, and I assert even on the, the, the BMI, then you already have high circulating leptin, which is going to contribute to what I just talked about. It's going to contribute to the concentration of leptin, and it's going to get you to leptin resistance faster as you eat. Okay, systemic in inflammation. This is another aspect of the standard American diet. The majority of people that are on it, remember, the standard American diet is high in carbohydrate and high in insulin expression. And for these individuals, systemic in inf inflammation also increases the, uh, um, the concentration of, of leptin, which is flowing in the blood supply, irrespective of, of where they are on their meal. And then lastly, high insulin, which is what we've been talking about, which exists on the standard American diet, leads to um, high or, or uh, substantially increased levels of leptin. When you put all these things together, when you put all of them together, what you get is leptin, leptin resistance. And what that means is you're not going to satiate. So you're going to eat more in the course of, of the meal that you're sitting at. And the actual satiety window, the window in which exists between when you finish eating and when you start your next meal is going to be substantially shorter. So, so to summarize, there are two reasons why uh, people on the standard American diet overeat. The first is uh, because of the dysregulation of leptin, they don't satiate, meaning that uh, they don't feel full so that they stop eating. It, that, that happening is pushed out. All right. The second reason is because the actual satiety window is really small and it comes after the blood glucose and the insulin and the leptin have crashed. So ghrelin is expressed with a, a fairly sharp incline, and now they feel suddenly very, very hungry, and the vicious cycle is started over again. Okay, so, now we can turn to the reason why people on a low-carbohydrate, high-fat, moderate-protein diet, in other words, why people on the keto diet actually lose weight. And this... This slide right here is, is the, the entire key to understanding what is going on, all right? And what you see here is the effect on blood glucose by the three main macronutrients, all right? And when we talk about 
macronutrients, that term is sounds fairly sophisticated, but what you just need to realize is that we utilize three main metabolites, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And what you can see in this diagram, uh, clear cut, is that carbohydrates by far have the most dramatic effect on blood glucose levels. Protein is significantly lower, all right? And fats are almost insignificant. They're way down here. So the thing, the thing is, if you're eating a low carbohydrate, high fat diet with moderate protein, the first thing you need to recognize is that uh, number one, we've ended the vicious cycle. Of, high, of a high blood glucose level, which also requires high insulin and also requires high leptin. So once we reduce the carbohydrates uh, from the diet, I'm just gonna like use an eraser here and break this, all right? Once we've reduced the carbohydrates out of, out of this equation, we are um, expressing uh, insulin to a much lower level and the pressure on the leptin has also been released so the point is and there's going to be two things that I really want to talk about here the, but the first point is that we have um, we, we have restored a proper satiety and we've done that in two ways, all right? A, we feel full early, early in the meal, because our system is working correctly. We feel, we feel for full early on, so we're having a satiation effect. You know, we eat till we full, until we feel full, and then we stop eating, all right? And the the second thing is is that we we have um, a large satiety window. So once we are full, we actually don't start to feel hungry again for actually quite a few hours. These days I'm only eating two meals a day uh, pretty much. If I do get hungry in the afternoon, like so, you know, sometimes not that frequently, I'll have a snack and if I do, it's going to be, you know, something like cream cheese or um, or maybe a few, couple slices of um, some type of salami or um, um, some, t some type of cheese or something like that. But basically, I've gone from eating five to, se to seven times every single day to just eating two, uh, two meals a day. All right. Um, the second reason why we lose weight on uh, this on the um, keto diet it is because of the fact that we um, are correctly partitioning macronu nu uh, macronutrients. What does this mean? All right, so on the standard American diet, when we have generated such high concentrations of insulin basically once you have filled all the surrounding cells that require energy with glucose then everything else regardless of who it is if it's an energy producing macronutrient it's going to get stored as fat so the other advantage that we have here is that our bodies are actually going to take the macronutrients the protein that we're putting that we're eating the fats that we're eating um, and those molecules are going to be distributed uh, relative to their functions. And what do I mean by this? Well, we don't burn all of the fat that we eat, right? Some of it's used to produce hormones, all right? Some of it's structural. We have cell membranes that are you know, that basically surround every single cell and those cell membranes are not just purely structural. I mean, the shape of the membrane and how those molecules are interacting with protein molecules that are in the membrane and stuff determine what gets into the cell, what comes out of the cell, and there are also chemical reactions that happen on the membrane surfaces. So some of the fat that we eat is used for that. 
And a similar argument can be made for the protein, right? Um, we, protein can be burned as energy, no doubt about it. Gluconeogenesis. Um, that's one way protein can be used. But proteins are also, they're used to build enzymes. And these would be the molecular machines that go around our body and do things. And there are other proteins that are used, um, and I'll just abbreviate it in here, in, a, in structural ways. All right. So w once you release the, uh, the, the insulin pressure off of the system, now our bodies are actually using these macromolecules the way that they're intended. Some of it's for energy. Um, some of it's for, as I've just said, other reasons. And um, generally, because we're, we're reaching satiety early, right? This happens early in the meal. We're, we're only eating what our bodies need at the time. And when we, when we, we require other calories and we're out at a deficit, like when you're working out in the gym or something along those lines, then we're going to start burning the fat calories. And the fat calories are going to come from your, uh, are from the adipocytes, from the visceral, external fat and internal fat uh, that we have uh, coating our, um, that coat a lot of our organs and the, the fat that we have on our bellies and, you know, the external stuff. All right, so this is the reason why we lose weight on the, on the ketogenic uh, diet. We restore uh, proper satiety and satiation, and um, we undergo partitioning, fuel partitioning of, of the different macromolecules that we're eating. And this to summarize then, the reason why people gain weight on the standard American diet is because of the dysregulation uh, of the insulin, leptin, ghrelin interrelationship. So they end up overeating in a meal because they don't satiate. They don't have that sense of fullness until later in the meal. That's number one. And number two, their satiety window is much smaller before they have this overwhelming feeling of hunger again and have to eat. So this results in a vicious cycle as they go up and down with this and they end up putting on weight uh, because they are exceeding the, the amount of calories that they should be eating. And then secondly, the master hormone insulin is taking everything uh, after fulfilling the sugar stores and putting those calories into fat. On a low carbohydrate, high fat, moderate protein diet, the keto diet, we have a much reduced carbohydrate load, which means we have a much reduced insulin load and we restore the relationship between insulin, leptin, and, and ghrelin. And so we satiate early in the meal. We have a sense of fullness early in the meal. And our satiety window is much longer. All right, the, the overall effect is we end up uh, losing weight because uh, we are eating fewer calories, not on an intentional level, but, but, but because our home hormonal systems are working correctly. Our satiety window is large, so we go longer periods between meals. When our body is at a deficit calorie-wise, it... it turns to the fat that we have in our body and it burns it. So our weight comes down. Eventually, you will weight stabilize somewhere. I started out this journey a little bit over a year ago at 168 pounds. And today, this morning, I was at 137.1 pounds. And I'm weight stable. Now, at, a, at between 137 to 140. All right? With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, in the next uh, segment of All Things Key.